What is up, Brad fans? Thank you so much for tuning in. And let me first start off by apologizing for our lack of output over the last, uh, let's say, two months. Some of you may know that we have introduced a new producer to my household, a little infant producer. Uh, and if you haven't dealt with an infant producer, let me tell you, they are, they are hard asses. They're strict. They're on you all the time, and they don't let subpar quality get out the door. So we had to scale back a little bit. I had to reevaluate what I was doing and, you know, frankly, just um, shape up. Shape up. There he is. He agrees. He approves. And you may actually hear him in the background of this episode fussing. Um, so th thank you for your patience, and we will be getting back to a more regular uh, schedule. Um... Let me start off, as always, by saying reach out to the show at 2 brad for you on Instagram and Twitter, 2 brad for you at gmail.com if you want to send us an email, if that's your thing. Uh, if you want to send us a voice message, speakpipe.com slash 2 brad for you Send us a voice message. We'll, we'll play it on the show. If you send us an email, we'll read it on the show. Uh, if you send us a tweet, we'll read it on the show. Or you can do what our guest today did, and send us a message and turn that into an appearance on the show. Today we are joined by Dr. Martin K. Nielsen. I met Martin years ago um, at a parasitology conference. He is a veterinary parasitologist. He specializes in equine research, equine parasites, so horsies, horsies for all you horse fans out there. Um, and he's a really passionate guy when it comes to horse parasites. He's very interesting. He does very cool research with that. But that isn't really what we were here to talk about today because Martin reached out to us on Twitter to, well, first tell us what how much he loves the show, of course. Thank you, Martin. Um, but then also comment on something he heard on the uh, lasting conversation we did with Jay Ingram. Um, just talking about some of the challenges uh, of science communication for actual academics. And Martin said to us, um, it would be interesting to have academics on to talk about their experiences trying to do science communication, what they learned, what the, what they, what the challenges were, what their colleagues were saying about it, that kind of thing. And so I said to him, why don't you come on and start that conversation and talk about that kind of stuff? And he said, I would love to. And here we are. So this is like lessons from the ivory tower on how to get that message out. Um, so Martin talks about his experience, uh, what he hears from his colleagues and stuff. And we turn that into a broader conversation about restoring faith in, in expertise in this sort of post fact world to use a term we hear in the post in the popular media a lot. Um, what, what is it, what, what do you do, you know, and Martin has a specific audience, the horse community, uh, ranchers, that kind of thing that, that follow his stuff, but he's learned some things about crafting a message for that audience and that the things that he's learned, I think can be applied to, um, science communication more broadly and just in general to this idea, like I said, of trying to restore faith in the experts you know these people do this science for for a living and they're really good at it and we should listen to them when they have something to say about a topic um he's learned some things about using sort of much maligned platforms such as facebook you know i'm, I'm the first to shit on facebook uh but he's found a really nice way of of using that to connect with his audience where they are uh using facebook groups so that was an interesting a lesson that came out of this. Um, and he's just a pleasure to talk to. Martin is uh, always, uh, he's always been really nice to me, um, really gracious with his time. And like I said, his enthusiasm shines through in everything that he does. So it's it's a real treat to have him on. I hope that we do it again. Um, and you can follow him on Twitter at Martin K. Nielsen on Twitter which Nielsen, as he points out in the episode, is spelt the Danish way, uh, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, so Martin K. Nielsen, he is originally from Denmark, uh, on Twitter, you can find him on YouTube as well, Martin K. Nielsen Equine Parasitology is the name of his channel, and he's putting up videos there on all things equine parasitology, it's 
really quite interesting to see his journey into into making videos and he's got his own little style now going and his page and I think it's really great and he also runs the um, Gluck Equine Research Center Facebook page so just look for Gluck that's luck with a G Equine Research Center uh, look it up on Facebook and you'll get all the stuff that's coming out of that um, center where he works so not just parasitology uh, it's all things horses um, infectious diseases uh, with horses and things like that um, yeah I think that's everything so like I said do what Martin did and get in touch with us either on Instagram or Twitter at too Brad for you you can send us an email too Brad for you at gmail.com or you can send us a voice message using speakpipe.com slash too Brad for you all of that is on our website too Brad for you dot wordpress.com you can go there. We will link to all of Martin's stuff. And that's it. That's all, eh? Did I get everything, Henrik? <coughs> Beautiful. Here's my conversation with Dr. Martin Nielsen. Okay. Martin, thank you so much for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you again. It's been a few years. It is, and it's it's an honor to be on this show. I, I actually didn't really think that that would ever happen, so um, thank you for having me on. I'm excited. Oh, wow. You make it sound so glowing, like it's this big platform. And you know what? To be honest, I'm a little brag here. In the end of 2020, the last month, December, we had sort of our highest level of engagement. We were getting around 800, 900 people downloading the show. So wow, it's getting bigger. It, and, it is it is and with uh maybe with a few of your twitter followers and your audience will will boost this thing over a thousand yeah, we'll see if we knows. can rally all five of them um. yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i don't think you should be so modest yourself because <laughs> well let me i wanted to start with for the audience with with this little anecdote this little story and maybe i'll put you on the spot here a little bit but we first met at the aavp um meeting in San Diego, and I can't even remember what year it was now, maybe like 2014 or something like this. Uh, um, 2012. Was it 2012? So it was even before. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So it's even yeah. before. It's, it's a long this time was, ago. Yeah. it's a veterinary parasitology conference. It was in San Diego, and it was me, my first conference, my first international conference, big conference at, as a grad student. So I had shown up there. Uh, it's also where I happened to meet, you know, our mutual friend and the co-host of this show brad yeah um, that's where i met the both of you for the first time yeah 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 but i was just I, I wanted to say this uh for our audience that there was a first night you know sort of people gathering in the lobby having a few drinks and stuff i didn't know anybody you were kind enough to you know engage me in a conversation as a young grad student i felt really welcomed by that and your enthusiasm for the subject of parasitology was you know, excuse the pun, infectious. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I thought that was a great, you know, you were the guy that was sort of welcoming the students and like making everybody feel sort of, you know, on yeah, equal and welcome at a, at a big event like that. So I, I got to say it was a real pleasure. I'm glad to have met you and I'm glad that we're doing this now. Well, I, I appreciate the, the comments. Uh, um, I, I do recall the, those conversations where we were talking about the, the, the fascinating life cycle of the parasite that you were working on. And that's a whole story in itself that we maybe that's that's for another another episode of this podcast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. that is fascinating. It's really, really interesting once you once you get into the nerdy details of that. So I, I remember talking about it. I also think that the society, the, the organization that's organizing this conference, that's really the culture. What you were describing, uh, you know, is really the whole culture of the conference that that all the, the, the established people are very accessible, very open. And as a student, you, you, we at least try to not make the students feel any intimidated by just walking up to someone in a coffee break or over a beer and, and having a chat. And I, I think this, this having grown up as a student in the organization myself, um, I think it's, and I've gone to different conferences uh, both before and after, I've never really come across a conference that has the same culture. So I, I think I think that that's just means so much to to and I and you just confirmed it to students that you know we can we why do we go to meetings we 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 do it 
really not to sit in on the talk so much and listen to whatever <laughs> Dr. So-and-so has to say. Um, it's for all of the, the social connectivity that, that going to a meeting entails. And that's what we've all missed out on for the past year. I mean, so the conferences go on. I'm actually organizing the AAVP meeting this year. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the chair of the program. And, and I'm also in, involved with another conference. And so either they're like 100% online or they try to sort of find some kind of hybrid format where there's a little bit of both. But, and, and most of that works really, really well. It's amazing actually, because now you're not in competition for, from you know running between sessions that are concurrent and one is delayed and you miss the next talk in the other room and whatever. Now you can just at your leisure, sit down and watch everything as many times as you want. Uh, because everything is pre-recorded, but what we cannot replicate in the online format is this whole social session setting. It just isn't possible. And, and so I think, you know, we're, we're all looking forward to getting back to that. Um, I know that really wasn't the topic of what we were going to talk about <laughs> today, but, but in some way it is because it's, yeah. it's all about how you communicate, right? So how do you communicate about science? Do, the way I try to think about it as someone who, who hustles with it is there's just so many different formats, platforms, audiences, and methods. And every, every one of those, you have to kind of shape your approach to because it's different. Like whether the, who you talk to, how you do it, what your messages are, what the recipient at the other end, what they know, what they don't know, what they're interested in. All of that changes every time you're on a new platform. And I think that's the big challenge nowadays because mm -hmm. the platforms are getting more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's this idea of science communication. I mean, it's like, and I want to thank you for reaching out to us on Twitter and, and bringing up the topic because it is a, it is a tricky one. And it's one that, um, you know, you speak with academics about it and usually the academics that I am speaking to about it by nature are interested in science communication or at least see some value in it and attempt to do it but it's not that's not sort of the you know the i would say the majority even probably of academics um that see that value in it or want to do it and you know so before you even get to the questions of like how to do it platforms you mentioned audience this these are all great things that i talk about in workshops that i give to grad students and stuff too yeah but like before you even get to that it's it's should you do it why do you want to do it should academics be you know taking the time to do this and you mentioned some of the things like uh before we started recording and in our back and forth on email and twitter you know this idea of like there's no there's no sort of push from your job or your establishment, your university to sort of help you in that, whether that's, you know, money, time off to do it, sort of encouragement, maybe workshops or anything like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think some uh, university administrators would probably strongly agree to uh, to those some of those statements that you just made, because I think any university will certainly have something in place. There is a communication department or office and there's newsletters and they and they all try to have a presence on social media. Um, departments, individual departments may also have their own social media pages, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not like there isn't anything. Um, there's certainly a recognition that things have to be communicated. Um, I think, I think as, as the scientists in the midst of it, I think you, you'll find different attitudes to how it should be done, how much time you should spend on it, what, how much of it is, is your responsibility as the scientist in the game, or how much of it is really just someone else's job, you know, who sits at the communication office and is tasked with writing a little Facebook post or something for a newsletter and is reaching out to you and go, Hey, Dr. Nielsen, I saw you just published this paper. Can you give me, give me three bullet points? So I think, th I think there's, there's that. I mean, it's not that it doesn't exist. And I also think that there are, most institutions will have um, some kind of workshop or offering or training or something in these things. I guess there's probably huge differences between institutions as to how much, 
emphasis and how much they invest in all of this. But, you know, I think it's it's a harsh statement to say that there's nothing. Mm. And I know that wasn't was what, what, what you were saying, but, you know, um, it could maybe have have come across as a little bit along those lines. And so so that's that's the, the first thing. But so I think one thing I, I picked up on was actually really sparked me to reach out to you was your your episode when you had Jay Ingram. Ingram. I mean, you've had him on for several uh, episodes, I realized. Mm-hmm. And I, I also learned that he's a big celebrity in Canada. Yeah. Um, and again, Biggest Canadian mentor. celebrity ever to be on the show. Yeah, and a, and a great <laughs> mentor to you. Mm-hmm. But, so, uh, but in the most recent episode, which was somewhere in the fall of 2020, you guys were talking a little bit about, and he made the statement that, you know, a lot of times the scientists don't really get any credit for the, the the scientific communication part of their of their job, mm-hmm. and I think that is correct. I think that's maybe where there is an issue, at least because, um, so we all get we're all you know under evaluation all the time for our productivity, our output, and so I get evaluated on how many papers I put out, the quality of those papers, uh, how many students that I graduate. Um, then how many grants and how much money I can I can accumulate, any patents, any any disclosures into public repositories as such as a, like a genetic sequence of something that got described in one of our studies. All of those things is just like you can count, okay, how many of those, how many of those, how many and then presentations are and things are such a, along the, those lines are in there. And and we all upload this material to this this portal that and then it gets actually reviewed by a committee and there's a recommendation and I actually have my yearly meeting tomorrow morning. So we'll see how, how Ooh. that went. Um, so there won't be enough time to slip this episode in there. Oh, I don't know. No, Maybe. <laughs> we can put that in the next round. Yeah. But, but so, so, so it is in there. There's, there's a category in the drop down menu in that system where you upload all of your things. So you put all of your papers, all of your presentations, everything in there. There's actually also a category for videos. So it's not like it's not uh, recognized and you, you put it in there, but it's, it feels like to me as someone who does maybe more than, than average, that it doesn't really count very much. It's like, okay, you're also doing that good, but uh, it's really sort of down the list of priorities when it gets evaluated. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so that's a little bit part of it. And so I am someone who's, it's my p- strong personal opinion that science isn't worth anything if you're not able to communicate it in an understandable manner to the regular person who might be interested in it. And, and um, I think, it kind of also depends maybe a little bit on the scientific discipline. Mine tends to be very sort of applied and hands-on. Okay, how do you go about deworming your horse kind of a deal, right? So that's something that people can relate to if they have a horse or if they are like veterinarians for people who have horses, then then um, then I have my audience right there. I guess if you do more basic science, uh, it might be a little bit more challenging to make it relevant to the society. Um so, so maybe it's easier for me. It's mm-hmm. maybe it's easier for me to to make the statement that you should always be able to distill your latest study into something, at least an overview, and it could be the three bullet points I just mentioned, and then, um, and then make it understandable to people. And and we still, I think, as scientists today, we're still often accused of, despite all of our, our newsletters and our social media presence, etc., we still get accused of being, you know, stuck in our ivory towers. And, and you know, I've often heard my department referred to as the world's best kept secret, which hurts. <laughs> it really hurts someone like me to hear that. Yeah. And so even though the information is out there, um, people don't necessarily see it. So, well, and this is, this is kind of, you know, maybe, you know, you mentioned maybe I was a little too harsh on saying that there's there's nothing there. But from my experience, and, you know, this is just me talking, so don't, whoever's listening, don't tarnish Martin's good reputation with what I'm about to say. But <laughs> as someone who now is on the other side of it and, like, sometimes deals with the university communications departments and stuff and sees the press releases and, and whatnot, it's not, it's not very good. You know, it's it's very 
formulaic it's kind of stuck in its ways and it's you know it's almost it almost appears to me like it's like this is the bare minimum you know we have to do this um this is our department we do the press releases yeah okay we put out a couple tweets you know uh, once a week or something like that but and maybe you could speak to this um it's not, it, there's no personality behind it right like it's just this very formulaic so and so from department here had a brand new breakthrough and they did this and one day it might help you know bald people grow hair again and isn't that great here's a quote here's a quote done you know there's no real beyond the sort of whenever someone has published a paper you get a tweet you get a press release done 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 but what i see from you is you're going beyond that like you're taking a bit more um of your time and do you choose to do this and you can explain why you choose to do it and and whatever but you're actually you know, making videos and sort of getting out there and, and it's, it's just got a bit more personality, you know, it's got a bit more. So that's kind of my thing about uh, why. So the, there is support there from the departments, but from the university, but are people accessing it? Uh, you know, what is the goal of that kind of thing? But, but, but like I said, what I see from you and, and others like you is breaking out of that it's like not just this okay we have to do the press release yeah. we're going to do something that's that's interesting and cool and we're going to try something and yeah no i thank you for saying that i mean because that that's actually been one of sort of my major points that i've been trying to make and i think sometimes my colleagues get like fed up with listening to martin again going <laughs> on about this but you know my point is my question is who should be telling our stories should it be someone like a communications officer over at that office who certainly has a, has an education in how to write something? Uh, should it be them initiating the story, or should it really be us? You know, we're the one who, who who are doing the work, and and that's what I think. I mean, we have a responsibility of telling our own stories, and it doesn't take a lot of work. And we can get the help from that someone who is skilled in how to frame it and how to kind of make it a little bit more slick and less wordy and, and not like remembering every single detail of everything, which I think is our tendency as scientists. We're like, we're, we're, we're trained to not leave important details out. And, you know, if you're, if you're <laughs> communicating on social media or, uh, you know, in any sort of setting where it's a lay audience, those details don't matter at all. Actually, they're mm -hmm. just problematic because they blur up the message, and so so it it can be it can be difficult. And but the only way to get better at it is try to do it. And if you fail, I mean, it's this is in my own experience. If you fail at writing the 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 catchy post that is still you know not misleading it and still at least conveys some of your of your findings in your most recent paper. If you if you fail at making it captivating. You know what? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. It just doesn't get picked up because it's yeah. too boring and too lengthy and it just isn't catchy enough. And then you can, no one's going to notice that you just repost the whole thing but reword it a little bit. And maybe next time around it gets picked up a little bit. And by the way, in my 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 own experience, I've come to sort of certainly realize that the goal isn't for any post to go viral. I mean, some people that I talk to tend to think, well, if it doesn't go viral, you're not successful. No, it's not the goal. And by the way, most of our stuff won't anyway, but it might reach a, a defined audience of people who have an interest in science and want to learn about, uh, follow what we do and and maybe pick up on something uh, of the latest findings. Um, and, and, and there's lots of those kinds of people out there. I, I get like high school teachers following me because they're like you're just seeking inspiration for the for a biology class and they may be horse people and then so then there's that combination of a couple things that that make them more prone to being interested there's in america there's the whole 4h community mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is pretty amazing all the work they do and you know the first time i i came into contact with 4h i was like somebody wanted me to review some material that they were using for teaching 15 14 15 year old kids and I looked at it and I said, you know, this is way too high level. This is this is PhD level. We wouldn't expect anyone at this age to even understand remotely any of this. And they said, well, no, they don't. They understand all this. They're really, really keen on learning this. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and so so there's all these kinds of people and they all have pages. 
whether or, or groups or whatever you call it on Facebook, on, on Twitter. And one thing, Brad, that I'm still an old fart here. So I have a wife and a daughter who, who really has been on my back for a long time for also getting on Instagram. And I'm like dragging my feet, which I've always, every time I added another platform to my portfolio of different places to be active on, I'm like, I don't think I need this in my life. I'm busy enough with the platforms that I yeah. try to maintain. This is yet another commitment. I don't even know. Oh, but they kind of, my daughter's been telling me, she's now 18. She's been telling me, <laughs> you know, Facebook is for old people, dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You're> yeah. Not... <laughs> but I'm an old guy then, I guess. But anyway, so, um, so there, there's, there's all of those considerations um, there. Uh, I forget the other part that you were touching on. Um, anyway, I'm sure yeah. we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I lose what I'm talking about all the time, too. It's not, yeah. it's, it's, but I, I think, you know, I'm curious as to, you know, again, like this, because I came across it when, um, when I was in academia. And, you know, I was, again, I was one of, obviously was interested in science communication, saw value in it. That's where I ended up, what I was doing. But seeing the resistance to it from some people. And like I said, there's this idea of maybe we just have to do the bare minimum. And let's let's put out there first right now that like we're not saying here that, you know, we're the experts and, you know, we everyone should do what we're doing or what you're doing or, what you know, we're just having this discussion about it. Um, but I did see there was a resistance to it. And it's, there's, there's, there's some people that, you know, it's just not them, you know, they're not outgoing people, they don't feel comfortable putting themselves out there. And that's fine. Although, we always found that a lot of those people, maybe they didn't want to be in front giving the talk or, you know, but they were happy to help, you know, or get the materials together, do some of the background research, you know, so people they wanted to help, but they weren't sort of the extroverts. But then there was also just a flat out, some people were just like, this is a waste of my time. Yeah. I don't, you know, wh why does it matter if whoever on the street knows what I'm doing and understands yeah. what I'm doing? And and it was that sort of, I, I'll right, come right out to it. There was a, there was some folks that had that arrogance to it that was like, and that's I think where you get these stereotypes of the ivory tower and and stuff yeah. like that. And I wonder if you have any thoughts. Just I'm like, is that a problem? Like or. Yeah. You, can yeah, you no, force I have those lots people to do the do the communication? Is that yeah, even a no, good no, idea? You, can't, you, know? you definitely can't force anyone to anything, uh, and 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 there's also this this notion of uh, trying to lead, you know, people in academia is like herding cats. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that too. So so yeah, no, definitely you can't force anyone to do anything. You can maybe try to lead by example. Um, and which is sort of what I'm trying to do, but what you that what you just described, your analysis of the situation is 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 very much my own experience. So so in, in thinking of it, there's a there's a bunch of different reasons to be um, a little hesitant, uh, to put it mildly, to in to spend a lot of time with on science communication. So there is. Um, well, there, there, there's the fear of, of being on social media. So, I mean, the older generation, even though Facebook is for old people, there's still a lot of us. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm middle-aged. I know you refer to yourself as middle-aged. That's not right, Brad. You're young. <laughs> I am 48, right? So I'm sort of right in the middle. Yeah. And, and I have colleagues that are mostly older than me. Um, and a lot of them are not on social media. And, and they have reasons for not being on social media. They're not comfortable. They're afraid of the, um, the, the, the trolls that they hear about or on there and just waiting to be annoying and make stupid comments. And, and they're also worried about the so-called sh shit storms. And so is that, that something gets the wrong attention from the wrong people. And we do animal research here. So, and sometimes we even euthanize animals. And so what about PETA? What about those groups? Mm -hmm. And, and, and some of those concerns are legitimate, right? I mean, you cannot just brush them aside and say, oh yeah, that's not a problem. And so you, you kind of have to at least have the, the monitoring in place to ensure that people are comfortable. So, so that's certainly one set of, of concerns is, is, is all of that. Um, and, and, and then it's just, yeah, do I, do I have to do it? Is it really necessary for me? 
that's another attitude that you find, you know, at least among some people. Um, I really don't think there's any argument for that attitude, honestly. I, I, I think, as I said before, my, you know, science isn't worth any, anything if it doesn't get communicated to the right people. I mean, to the to the end user people, not just to other scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I think, you know, you, if you ask sort of in all the official places, there's no way anyone would disagree with that statement. And even if you look at the federal funding agencies here, like NIH, for example, in all of their programs, they have a huge emphasis on how does this information gets communicated to K through 12, to society, to people out there um, and you need to emphasize that in your in your proposals right it's more than just writing that lay summary that you and Jay were talking about there's actually has to be okay how can some of this information get in the hands of people that are in education or are so-called end users of of what you're working on so there's certainly there's certainly emphasis enough but yet there are people who feel you know they're worried about the time consumption that they um you know, are going to waste way too much time on it and they're busy enough anyway. Uh, teaching loads have only gotten heavier with uh, online teaching and then there's all the grant proposals that tend to take more and more time and then you also have to finish your work and supervise your students and get your papers written and blah, blah, blah. There's all of that. And then there's, the, the, you mentioned the word extrovert, uh, introvert. That's actually something that I hadn't really thought about very much up until recently. I actually was interviewing for a job um, and someone said to me uh, that most scientists, if anything, tend to maybe be more introvert than extrovert. That kind of, I think the, 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 the academic method, how you work, how you sort of nerd and you dig down into the mm -hmm. deep, deep detail level of, of your subject sort of speaks to that introvert personality. It's definitely and the that, stereotype so, for sure. Yeah, and so so if you are that type of personality, and then you're probably less keen on the whole idea of getting up there and you know posting things on on your on your on social media accounts or you know making videos, which is in my experience certainly the most effective way of reaching a large a large audience. Videos just tend to get more uh, attention than most other types of posts, um, and. And so there's also that. And so forcing people um, is never the way to go. One thought that I had about it was to, well, every lab in in our department has students and postdocs that tend to be younger, tend to have grown up more with these, these electronic media and are more comfortable, more familiar. And so I've kind of been trying to just not talk to the PIs but talk to the students and you know whenever i see one of them publish a paper i saw that just this morning somebody from another group and i say hey that's great congratulations do you want to send me just a couple lines and i'll put it on the on the departmental facebook page and you know and then it's up to them to get their pi to approve it if they feel like they have to they probably do <laughs> um but it's not my problem um and and then they can develop the content and get the pi to approve so i think that's probably the way it works best mm -hmm. to kind of work through that younger generation uh, and get them engaged with it and also get them exposed to it and get them thinking about okay what is the message of my paper actually when i think of it what is it what's the take home what can we learn um, what is the most interesting aspect? And and one thing that I've certainly come to realize myself with all this is, you know, whenever you write a post about your most recent paper, you shouldn't necessarily think that you have to include all of the take homes, um, take home messages. You know, maybe one or two of them makes it for a much more interesting post uh, than trying to capture and embrace everything, which again, like I said, we're we're sort of trained to do. So. So there's also this, how do you best do it? Is, is two or three posts better than one? Maybe sometimes they are. I mean, so anyway, so so there's the personality aspect of it as well. Um, but I, I, I do feel in my department here that I'm pretty much alone <laughs> with, you know, being the guy who wants to do all these things and mm -hmm. wants to encourage others to do them as well. My department chair has been uh, supportive. Um, but he also hasn't really done a whole lot to 
initiated. I, I think he doesn't, as a department chair, you, you also got to be careful. You, you're not the dictator. You, you're someone who's, you know, soliciting input and trying to seek a consensus and get buy-in from your, from your faculty members. So you're not someone who sits at the top of the organization and just orders everyone to do something, right? So he's also been careful with that. And, and just like I've realized, you can't just push it. Um, but I think as, as, as we go through generation change and, you know, senior faculty members eventually retire and then we hire new people that are younger and, and you know, there, there probably will be a change going on. It's just slower. Um, academia mm -hmm. is slow with everything anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it is going in, in the right direction, um, but just I'll be slowly. Here's, yeah. here's a thought. Um, and it's like, okay, let's sort of, you have an audience that you've described that you, you know, tailor a lot of your stuff to the horse community, we'll say. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a very specific audience. But I, in thinking about science communication, sort of, let's, let's zoom way out, right? And you've mentioned a couple times that science isn't worth anything unless it, it's communicated. And that's kind of the you know, the idea I want to play with here is this, the, the bigger sort of maybe philosophical of, of communicating science and, and some of the challenges and stuff. Because if you look at some of the challenges that the world faces right now, well, you pick, pick one, you know, politics, whatever, the, the pandemic, uh, climate change, all of these things, there seems to be a, a, movement of distrust of experts science yeah. denialism whatever you want to call it things like that and it just jogged my mind in thinking about this because you talked about the younger generation coming in and the same thing gets applied to this kind of stuff oh well the old people don't want to change their ways or they don't believe in climate change or, or whatever it is but i wonder if there's like i think you know this is obviously my opinion i i wouldn't be doing the stuff that i do without it but there really does need to be a culture change in terms of getting back to looking at science and scientists as you know people that we trust people that you know the the information is there and how do we how do we do that through yeah, science that's, communication that's, you know yeah that's uh, that's excellent that's an excellent point and it is a big challenge to us and it's not going to go away this the skepticism towards science and i think some of that is is a self-inflicted wound so it's part of it is our own fault and our own responsibility as scientists the the number one thing i have strong opinions against and some people listening if if there's any uh, will disagree <laughs> with me on this but the preprint preprint publication uh you know approach that we've seen in recent years I think it's deeply problematic. So if, mm. okay, so if you're listening, you don't know what that is, preprint pre -print publication. I can't even pronounce it. So, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> preprint publication. So the I, it started as sort of a little bit of a, an objection to to the big publishers. So like the, these, that the journals, the scientific journals that publish our papers, that they, we used, you know, before when the paper's approved, you kind of sign off on, a, on this little form that, that turns over the, the copyrights to them. So then all of a sudden they own the content that you worked your butt off to, to, you know, to generate. And the only thing they did was just to put it in their journal. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they own it. And so people were objecting to that, that that's fundamentally wrong. And uh, I mean, it should be the scientists who own the content. And so as and an, to make as it a, available freely, that's the other thing. Yeah. Right? It's like once the yeah. publishers have it, if I wanted to look up your latest paper, I might have to pay 50 bucks or something in some cases, you know, so there's, yeah, so, there's, so that, there's the open science. There's the subscription open. model there versus the open access, which is kind of related, but also a little bit separate. But but so the, the, the protest was, okay, but there are no rules against publishing our our paper before it goes through the peer review process and gets edited and gets typeset and set up for, for publishing. Right. Because we still own that and that is allowed. So there are these places where people can do that. So that, and, and they're doing this like to a big extent. Now, um, that's not peer reviewed. Okay. So, th so there hasn't been a couple of people with expertise in that topic. 
uh, reviewing the paper and going, okay, th is this solid? Are they kind of jumping to conclusions here? Are they cherry picking a little bit? Is that is the data are the data analyzed correctly? All of those things that 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 reviewers look for that mm -hmm. hasn't happened now. That's not a perfect system. Gosh, there's a lot of published papers out there that you know kind of slip through the cracks for whatever reason. Uh, we're all just humans, and sometimes as an editor. I work for one of the journals, Veterinary Parasitology. I'm one of the editors in chief there. Gosh, it can be difficult to even find people who have the time to do mm -hmm. that, to review the paper. And it's voluntary. You don't get anything for it. It's, you know, it's even anonymous. So you can't even, you can't list it anywhere. So yeah. back to the problem of not getting credit for things. Anyway, um, what I think we've seen with COVID, the whole pandemic, is that the weakness in the preprint model is that if you're just someone who's quite controversial and but wants to kind of get the attention of media and just sort of get out there before anyone else with crappy research, you can just get a preprint out. There's no check and balance there. Mm -hmm. And that happened. I mean, the, the hydroxychloroquine with that mm -hmm. guy in France, I mean, that was just baloney research. But a few people... <clears throat> Uh, you know, with a big following on social media, no names mentioned, picked up on that. And then all of a sudden you had people treat, trying to treat themselves with stuff to clean aquariums with and all that stupid stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but so, and then you get the contradiction. Okay, so one paper came out, could still be reasonably good science, but, you know, you can't do everything right necessarily in just a single study. And there's always other aspects to evaluate. And so the next paper comes out and by a first glance, it looks like, the conclusion is the exact opposite. That's just a scientific process. It's how it goes. And then you get more and more papers done. And finally, somebody can do a meta-analysis across all of the papers and then find out what the consensus is uh, in, a, in an appropriate manner. But but people aren't the, the, the public. And so we want to communicate about the science. But at the same time, this the science, you know, watching it real time happening and watching that iterative process of okay one study done next study done the third study done and then newspapers trying to pick up on them and write a new story things get very confusing very quickly and it, i can see how it causes some people to all of a sudden lose trust in science because they these scientists don't seem to agree and these all of these different studies are like pointing in all kinds of directions and there's really very little sense to make of it while it's going on, right? And so so I think that's been a big problem. And, I, and to me, a big revelation, I have not to this day published anything in a preprint. Mm -hmm. I am an old-fashioned fart. <laughs> so even though I, some reviewers do a crappy job, I only publish mine, I make them, and I only write my, uh, my social media posts once a paper is fully accepted and, and online. Right. And then I, I publish it when, with the link to that paper. Mm -hmm. So so I think that's certainly a big sort of issue that, uh, that we're part of. And then the other part that I also think we're guilty of, and you and Jay Ingram talked about this, how scientists write their scientific papers. And I like what Jay was saying there. He was saying, well, there's, there's just a tendency to make things look as complicated as possible by using this this obscure language that no one really seems to understand and full of abbreviations that you kind of have to go back and go, okay, I, E, D, C, I, X, Y, what was that again? And try to find where it's mentioned the first time in the paper. So again, a lot of people might disagree with me. There was a number of different ways to write a scientific paper. I often get criticized for being too plain mm. in my language because I write first person. Right. We found That's a that no-no. Our results show that. That's how I write my papers. And I sometimes get told, no, no, no. It has to be third-person passive tense. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And there's no point. So what are you accomplishing by that? What does that help? Mm -hmm. Does that help anything? No, it doesn't. It, it just makes it more cumbersome to read. What? Why do we want to do that? And so, uh, again, in, in other people's defense, I think my work tends to be pretty simple. I'm a simple mind. It's pretty, you know, it's not rocket science. What I do, it's like poking in a pile of poop with a stick most of the time. That's kind of, <laughs> I'm a parasitologist, right? So maybe it's easier for me. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is easier for me. But I think it's something we can all think about. How do you write a paper? When I wrote my, my PhD dissertation, 
I got criticized for my lay language, but they couldn't, you know, they couldn't fail me. <laughs> the like, science okay. was still good. It's it's a matter of style, right? Yeah. We can discuss different styles. That's fine, but you can't you can't like knock me down for it. But I, I do think we also have a responsibility there. I mean, it's tempting to just want things to look very complex and complicated because it makes your signs look more significant. Bit of ego there, you know, we're all human. I mean, sometimes if it comes across as, as very, very simple, you might get the question from a reviewer, okay, so is there even enough merit in this work to warrant publication of this? Right. Yeah. And so maybe there's a little bit of bias there. So I think, I think we really, as scientists, also need to kind of <clears throat> think about you know how we do how we even communicate scientifically i mean we we opened this this podcast talking about science communication so you know from scientists to to society if you will but there's also sciences to sciences communication that i still think we could definitely improve on and uh, i thought the statistics that jay ingram was mentioning in that in that episode of, of the, the number he asked you like what how many different abbreviations do you think those you know has been have been introduced in scientific papers over the past i can't remember how many years yeah right yeah you threw a number out that was way off it was way higher and it was like how many of those have been used more than x number of times and it was like such a small percentage so people just like invent these terms i i'm also old-fashioned i hate abbreviations in my papers i would rather write the words fecal egg counts eight times then you know write it out only the first time and then and then feck if you yeah. see <laughs> just as an example even though that's probably as a parasitologist that's one abbreviation that you shouldn't struggle with right, right? yeah but i still I, th I think it disturbs the flow of the yeah. text for yeah, me yeah. the text is just more pleasant to read and look at when you have the words and not just all these these letters but i, I agree I'm, with that one i found like so many abbreviations it takes you out of the, out of the reading of it yeah. and it's an interesting point you bring up that this you know and i guess jay and i had talked about it but yeah like this why why is science for the scientists let's say you know the 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 paper the, the journal papers the peer-reviewed journal papers because i don't think we expect anyone you know, sort of, we kind of started this section of the conversation saying, you know, the public, a better scientific literacy amongst the public might be better to help society and some of these things. But it's not realistic to, to get to think that everybody is going to start reading scientific journals, even if they were oh. free, even if the peer reviewed process, um, the publishers made them all free to everybody, right? But there's, I still think there is value in what you're saying, um, in terms of, yeah, like you said, scientist to scientist, how might that improve? Uh, cooperation between different mm -hmm. fields, different departments, that kind of thing. But then also for journalists, right? Like I'm coming at science journalism with a pretty good understanding of science, having done my PhD and how it's written and how it goes, you know, so I feel like I've got a leg up on some other people in this field um, in terms of shifting through like the bullshit, right? Like all that <laughs> crappy writing. Um, mm -hmm. But this is where maybe that, that disconnect in terms of, you know, like you said, with the hydroxychloroquine example or something, you know, there's translating that what results and what is important and what actually happened and what it actually means uh, from this academic ease, whatever you want to call it, to, you know, sort of the layperson. If the first step, the actual journal paper was much more accessible, was much easier to understand, maybe that whole process goes better, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there, there's just no perfect solution. And so, you know, the, the preprint model, I mean, one point to that is that the paper is fully accessible. You can you can look at it, you can read it and depending on how it's written and you might make some sense of it or maybe uh, a lot of sense and maybe not no sense at all. I mean, it's, <laughs> it can be difficult for a lay person to read, but the paper is there. And one thing I certainly have noticed in 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 the in the papers like the press is that they've they've learned most journalists have now learned to mention whenever they they reference a paper like a study that just came out whether or not it's been peer reviewed right that yeah. is something that i have noticed least, that I was, too yeah so i think that's positive that i i don't know if the readers always understand but they kind of at least kind of know okay there's something there uh that this paper doesn't have and maybe has has less credibility than so at least the press um 
public press has, has sort of picked up on that, that that seems to be important. And I think it's helped like people like Anthony Fauci that, um, you know, would, would uh, he, there was, he, he was like witnessing in front of Congress where they asked him all these questions. Um, but then, you know, it's difficult sometimes because someone found this paper, I think it was on hydroxychloroquine again, um, or maybe it was remdesivir. I can't remember. One of these things uh, from a big group here in America, the, the Fort Foundation that had it published, and it was peer reviewed. So, you know, you ticked all the boxes. It looked like there was like evidence for an effect of the whatever the modality was. I think it was chloroquine. Um, and then, so they were throwing that in the face of uh, Fauci, and, and he said, well, it doesn't matter <laughs> because the study was flawed. Yeah. And they were like, but, but, but what? Yeah. And, and so, and because a lot of these patients had also received dexamethasone, which we know helps. And so it was flawed by design that they weren't controlling for that uh, confounder, right? And so somebody who's a scientist and has some training can, oh, quickly understand that, oh yeah, of course that's flawed. But then of course, as, as the, as the politician or, you know, the, the general public person, you're going to go, so why all that emphasis on the peer review process if something like that can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's what I said. It's it, it's not a perfect system. We we just don't have anything better um, in terms of, you know, approval process for the work before it gets published. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but circumventing it with a preprint system or approach, I don't think it's a good solution either. Um, yeah. It's just, it's too much. I mean, in society today, there's just enough information. I mean, there's just too much information. Yeah. And, and everybody, and I'm listening to to many episodes of your podcast where you guys are discussing this in various contexts that, you know, people are becoming so skeptical about any source of information and, and you can understand why. So, and the conclusion often tends to be, well, we can trust no one, so we can only trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of trust themselves to sift through all the information and tell the good information from the bad information or the unbiased from the biased. And there's no way any human person can do that. I mean, it's, it's beyond our capacity as people. It, it, it takes a bioinformatic approach to do that. So it's also problematic. And then, of course, my, some of my colleagues will say, yeah, and in that world, you want us to be out there too. And I go, yeah, I do, because there's also, there's both good and bad information out there. At least maybe we can be recognized as the source, the trustworthy source of, you know, in the sake of my department, it's everything equine. We were an equine research institute here, right? So we do all things equine that hopefully somebody who has an interest in that topic will get to recognize us as a, a trustworthy source. And, and, but we're going to be out there in the middle of everything else, in the middle of conspiracy theories and all crazy kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely understand where the reluctance is coming from. I still, don't, I still think we should all do whatever we can. And, and by pouring more information into this already confused world, um, but I, I don't see we have a choice. I don't, I, I don't think silence is an alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is complicated. It, it is. And so I, I definitely, definitely give my skeptical colleagues a lot of credit there. I mean, it's not that their concerns don't have merit. They certainly do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Yeah. Well, and that's th this idea of, you know, being able to sift through the information, right? And so then it's like, you know, part of, I, I kind of think we could go two ways here. You know, one of them is, you know, establishing like you kind of, it's kind of sounded like you were saying, you know, you could establish your brand. Let's, let's call it that as a trustworthy source. And how do you do that? You know, probably just repetition over time, continual um, being out there. And I would imagine being humble and being honest with people about the shortcomings, right? Like, well, we haven't figured it all out or, you know, these things take time. And then the other thing is, well, how much, um, should scientists, the, the science world, let's say, be focusing on educating about the process, right? Like it's like people yeah. always talk about now that, you know, again, you said there's so much information out there. We talk about, um, you, you're hearing more people talk about media literacy, right? Like how do you sift through news reports and stuff and understand what's 
biased in the political sphere, right? But it's the same for for yep. science and health yep. information. Like, look at all of the the BS that's out there about nutrition and and diet and stuff. You know, oh, like my goodness, it's yeah. it's awful, right? So oh, the, there's this, a lot of that in the equine world too. My goodness, there's so many supplements for horses that are being yeah. Oh my goodness, there's just so much <laughs> of that. And then some of them even claim that they, well, they can't really officially claim it, but then they assign a name to the product that makes it sound like it is good for parasite control, or like that it will kill worms. Okay. And so there's there's a lot of that in the in the equine world as well. Well, as you were talking right now, it, it kind of, it got me to thinking that one trend that I have observed actually over maybe the past couple years only. And so I've joined a couple, actually three or four different Facebook groups that are closed groups that are mod moderated groups where people can ask questions. And so there's like vet to vet groups where it's equine veterinarians that are asking each other questions. So they're sharing like experience. How do you guys do about go about doing that? that? Have you seen this? Do you have any input on this case? And I just sit there whenever somebody is asking about worms, I make sure to be the first to answer because a lot of people have been have some, let's say, not quite up to date information on some of those things. So mm -hmm, I want to mm -hmm. be there and I hope that then others are reading it as well. There's also some very popular groups where it is ask the vet. So as a horse owner, you can ask the horse vet, you can ask the small, the dog and cat veterinarian. Those are a lot of those groups and those are moderated. So, you know, they kick out all the, the BS, all the other people that are not veterinarians that try to respond. They get well that those comments get deleted and the people get kicked out of the group right and so there's pretty strictly moderated and one thing i noticed a couple times now just in recent months that you know somebody said and more than one person said you know i'm actually quite fed up with being on social media i can't t stand all the people arguing with each other over trump or whatever it is like there's plenty of things to disagree on and sharing these this this um information that may not be completely <clears throat> correct if you will uh, and, and and they get fed up with watching that once they log on to to their to their profiles whether it's facebook or whatnot but the only reason that these people are still on facebook is because of these closed groups with mm -hmm. that are moderated where there's sharing of information where they learn more than than any for veterinarians any like ce seminar that they have to take they learn more there than they they do in any of these official events and and so that gives me hope right yeah because because okay so there's there's ways to do something that certainly satisfies a big group of people not all the people in the world but the people who are actively seeking this kind of information that wanted from a trustworthy source and there's a way to make there's a way or several ways to make those sources trustworthy by having good moderation and and i think um even for myself i mean I, i'm I'm on Facebook and, and ha, you know, having moved here from Europe, I, I'm Danish originally. I've been in the States now for 10 years. It's been a good way for me to keep contact with family and friends and mm -hmm. sharing some pictures so they can follow what we're doing and we can see what they're doing. And, and has, it has sort of helped us as a family. And so that's been my number one reason for, for being there to begin with. I don't ever utter just a single word about politics. I never do that on there. <laughs> Uh, I, lots of people get very much into doing that, but I don't. Uh, but I, I talk about family things and then work. Um, and I also moderate. I actually administer the uh, Facebook page for my whole department. <laughs> it might be a little sort of dominated by parasitology content, I, you know, maybe. Hey, but, you're the one running it, so you get yeah. to, you're the editor, right? <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, I just put out whatever I think is appropriate for the work that we do, and I then try to at least support and help others that might also be interested in sharing some of their information. And I also encourage others, like I talked about the students, working mm -hmm. with the students in some of the other labs. But but certainly that this this these comments that I've now seen in, in recent months about, you know, the, the only reason why I'm on this platform is because of this group. I think speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. So if, if nothing else, there's that. Um, I, I also, uh, so yeah, so that aspect of joining these groups uh, and being one of the many, many people who respond to questions, I don't know very many, you know, professors at, you know, universities that will ever think that it's for them to do. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of my colleagues that are on there, like in various places. So there, there are other people like me 
Um, but I think it's an excellent venue because not only even in, in uh, Ask the Vet groups where it's horse owners asking vets questions, there's other vets in there. Then they read, we read each other's responses. And then there's this administration page that we're also members of. And so if there's anything that, you know, didn't make sense or, you know, where we might, we actually might want somebody specific to maybe chime in, we can, we can alert them there and we can have a background discussion without all of the followers watching. It's, it's actually amazing how well it works. So for me, that's been meaningful. And I also want to say as a scientist, by doing all of that, and this is a statement that I often make to, to colleagues who are hesitant or skeptical, um, what it does to me is that it reminds me what the concerns are on people's minds out there. Mm -hmm. What are they facing? What's, how are they thinking about it? What are the misconceptions? Where are the knowledge gaps? Um, or how could I maybe disprove this claim that someone else is making all the time that annoys the heck out of me mm -hmm. because I don't think it's right, but also I can't really disprove it because I don't have the data. So there's such a constant source of inspiration for me in my research and also my next seminar, my next video that I might be making um, because I, I now know what you know, a commonly asked question is or a common misconception or something that a lot of people are thinking about. And that certainly helps sharpen your communication, right? When you know that, you know your audience. So for me, it's been a way to get to know my audience better. And by audience, I mean both horse owners and veterinarians. Actually, honestly, if it's just between you and me, uh, horse owners often get parasitology much better than than the pairs than the veterinarians do. <laughs> I think there's an interesting psychology there because horse owners approach it by with a total total open mind. Just tell me anything, I'm willing to learn. Like at least the horse owners who would sign on sign up to a page like that, right? And they don't have this I already know something about this attitude. As a veterinarian, you know that I, you're supposed to know something about it you've learned something it might be decades ago or just a few years if you haven't really boosted that knowledge you've forgotten most of it but you tend to have a little bit more of a defensive attitude i would as well right mm -hmm, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm no better than anyone else i just think it's a fundamental your your the, the mentality that you approach a situation with affects how much you pick up on the information mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if you think you have more you actually have knowledge already you kind of you you know tend to unconsciously maybe defend that knowledge rather than go, oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's how it is. Because if it's in conflict with what you think you know or what you learned once or whatever, and there's there's so many different veterinary schools and they're not all taught the same things anyway. And so, so I just wanted to share that because I think it's been extremely useful to me. And I was reluctant, a little bit like Instagram. Maybe I'll be on Instagram eventually. I probably will. Uh, you know, I've said the same things every time. I said the same thing about Facebook one time and, and then Twitter and then YouTube. I have a YouTube channel now, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I have all of it. <clears throat> that I also thought about signing up for this big group of that's called Horse Vet Corner. It has, I don't know, 120, 30, 40,000 people following. Whether that would take too much of my time. But... It just ended up being like part of my routine. I check my social media. I, I go onto the group. I search for the word worm. Most recent posts. If there's nothing there, then, you know, I'll, then I'll be fine. If there's something, I usually can respond very quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't take long. Um, and it's worth it. So, so at least I wanted to share that. And then I've also, just because I realized that a short video usually gets more attention than anything else you post. I mean, you, I can post a picture of some gross looking worms that usually get some attention as well. Right. The ick often, factor. Right. Yeah. But a video of me talking and showing a few things um, really, really helps. And so some people criticize me for being oh, so full of myself and I love to see myself on the screen and I just want to put myself front and center all the time and it's all about Martin, Martin, Martin. Um, I, I, there may be, I, may, I may actually like it. I, I, I won't deny that. There's nothing uh, wrong with that. Hey, that's why I do no, this too. I love the yeah. sound of my own voice, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, but my fundamental belief is that people connect to, to people. Right. They connect to faces. You have to put a face to the name Um. And, and I, I do have some, some colleagues who go, well, the science should speak for itself. It, it shouldn't matter who the person behind is. No, it matters. 
-hmm. it does matter that it's this lab and i try to do I, I i try to actually promote my students too it's not just always about me it's also you know my this student just published her paper and then a picture of her mm -hmm. and and one picture from either her be doing the work or like one of the graphs or something that is meaningful and and to to post alongside with a little blurb about what was found and then the link to the paper um so i try also to promote my students i hope i do a pretty good job for me it's actually more important to promote the students because they're on the threshold of you know their careers and, and, and getting out there and also i task them with trying to develop the content because that is so different than writing that abstract for the next scientific conference or the whole paper for that matter is so different you have to really tune into a, an entirely different channel which i think is what actually gets me excited i think that's so fascinating so i, t I start talking about i started talking about the different platforms and the different audiences and how you need to shape it every time and think about uh, how should i say this and how what should i leave out and how can i simplify uh the message without losing uh, losing it right and so so that's fascinating so with the videos i you know i i've i've been, been on a journey and i've made a lot of I've made a bunch of bad videos, really, really pathetic videos. And so you shouldn't be afraid to embarrass yourself is my point. So I may love watching myself on a video, but I also don't have anything against really making a fool of myself. Mm -hmm. And I've done that many times. You have to be, so that's this, part of it too, right? Like you have yeah. to be willing to have that humility. And, and then, and then reflect on it and be self-critical. So one thought, one, at one thought I had got, I had the idea, like and in hindsight, this was so wrong, but I thought, well, people's attention span is so short. So you have to make the videos ultra short, like uh, 45 seconds, 60 seconds max. Yeah. And then really only one point, one major point, one major drive home, take home message per video. And then let that be it. So I developed this whole series of videos that I call deworm debunk. So I took like a lot of the misconceptions that I had seen like as I talked about people asking questions and and sort of demonstrating their their misconception, which is there's so many things in equine parasite control that's so common. Oh, deworm at the first frost. And I don't, I'm not going to get into the details why that's wrong. But that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, and and so and so I developed this series of these ultra short videos, and they would be short enough to also post on Twitter. So I thought that was really smart. What I had mis misunderstood was, yes, people may have a short attention span, but for those people who are actually interested and decide to click on the video to see what it's about, it is really disappointing that it's only 45 seconds. Yeah. Like, it's like there's nothing there. That guy is not saying anything. He's not even explaining it. He's just saying it's wrong because that's yeah. all I had time for. So I really realized, okay, that was so wrong and so stupid and so misunderstood by me. And I thought I was someone who, like, you know, could claim to, to understand social media a little bit. And there I just illustrated I was just being a big boomer yeah, <laughs> and really didn't understand it at all. And so, so, so then in my next series, I then, okay, realized I have to kind of actually really spend some time on each video and put really tangible content in there. So they're now, those videos are like between 30, uh, 15 and 30 minutes each. And, and so I really go into the depth and of trying to, you know, explain things and concepts uh, and show things on the videos. I like, I have worms in jars and I have pictures that I edit in. I finally found out how to use iMovie, which <laughs> actually isn't difficult at all, I realized. So, uh, and then I also found out the one thing I've struggled with a lot, you know, I, I try to, I, I think I'm a funny guy, but, or at least, you know, I think maybe my, my wife tends to think that, you know, it's a lot of it's a bunch of dad jokes but okay yeah, yeah. Uh, but i've not really been able to kind of strike that balance in these in these different in how i communicate about how i present like give presentations that you know i i couldn't really find a way to 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 work in a joke and be a little funny without being just coming across as as not being serious about it yeah um What's difficult without I, an I, audience too, right? Because you don't get that feedback. Like you don't know yeah. how it's going to land, right? It's You're really right. taking a risk. Yeah. But so, yes. But you should be willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. So so what I tried in my most recent series was from actually from this COVID spring last year was to go, all right, forget about it. Let me just 
work in a few really really silly jokes and see how that's taken like really really like the only kind of joke i could ever come up with I, you know i don't have like the sophisticated jokes so it's really just like really dad jokes yeah yeah and people loved it yeah yeah they really loved it and then so and you could you could do that you could go from like cranking out a stupid joke like that and then go on to some pretty serious content okay let me explain why this is wrong and here are a few facts and then go back to doing something really goofy and silly and it worked so so I think I found my style in these videos. Now, I want to do another series this spring. It's just like I keep thinking, well, maybe next week I'll start having more time. But ah, <laughs> never that's happens. never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I, I, I will. And people have requested more videos of those uh, of those sort of in those in that kind of style where I'm just sitting in my lab. And I try to do them one shot because I'm too lazy to sit back afterwards and edit them. So just one shot and if i if i forget something uh what what uh, who cares right yeah people will maybe not even notice i might be a bit rambling a bit disorganized but that's just my personality yeah yeah uh, so 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 i've also just sort of come you know i've learned along the way and i'm still pretty much a boomer uh i i but i you know i have mostly white hair now and um, my my kids are certainly reminding me all the time that I am a boomer. But I think even <laughs> as a boomer, you can you can you can be in that space and make it meaningful. At least yeah. I believe it is. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, you touched on so many things there. Like it's yeah. You, it, I think it's you know it's honesty. It's it's personality. And this is I think at the beginning we kind of mentioned that that you know there's this the standard way of, you know, a press release, blah, 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 you know, a generic tweet kind of thing like that. But it's like, it's the personality obviously engages people and you have an engaging personality and you're willing to take the risks and get out there. That's part of it. But it's also, it's like you said, you talked about trust and stuff as well. And people trust a face, they see a face and they, they connect with that. And I think that's like, that's part of it. Right. So I think there's this idea again, like getting back to sort of the big picture science communication, the you, you need those right like you need those mm -hmm. characters you need those faces you need people that they can relate to it and they can trust it um and you you said you you found your audience right like it's the other thing that i always talk to students about when i'm giving um uh talks on science communication it's audience right like you have to know who you're speaking to and you have to find them so do a little work you know, do a little digging around on, you know, Google your, your subject matter and see what people are talking about. And you mentioned these groups, you know, where you're, it's keeping you relevant by connecting yeah. to the people. And that gets you out of the, you know, quote unquote, ivory tower as well. Right. And right. even if it's not just, you know, you know, vet, vet, vet horse peristology, if yeah. more people sort of did that and sort of tried to reach out and connect and see, oh, Oh, this is this is why people are afraid of vaccinations, or oh, this is why people think that, you know, maybe climate change isn't a big deal or something. Maybe you can actually actually address their concerns rather than just having this sort of caricature of who that person is and saying, oh, they're just an idiot, or oh, they're just a right winger, or oh, they're just a you know whatever it is, right? So that's really interesting, and I'm kind of, I'm really fascinated by this idea of the moderated groups too that you found here yeah. to do all of that. And it's like, you know, yeah, Facebook gets, you know, a lot of bad press and rightly so for some reasons, but oh, yeah. using the tool for, you know, finding a way that it's useful. I'm like, I'm wondering now, like these moderated groups, how do you expand that? Can you expand that to other topics? You know, yeah. that kind of thing. It's really fascinating. You. So, so there was, um, so in Denmark, I mean, so a couple of the groups that I follow are still like from, you know, my, my, my peers back home in Denmark. So, so in Danish. Um, and I, I also chime in there, you, uh, just, it's friends from vet school and people that I know, I mean, I'm a horse person myself, so there's a lot of that, the community feeling uh, to it there. So one thing that, um, was initiated on Facebook, I actually don't know who took the initiative during COVID was to set up a page for ask a doctor about COVID. Hmm. And, and so medical doctors, so, th so there is a bunch of people, vet, med, med doctors on there that are responding to all of these questions that all the people have. And again, it's moderated. So you, you, the trolls are weeded out and, and the irrelevant questions and the inappropriate responses and all of that is removed immediately. 
Italy. And, um, and it, what was interesting is that a couple of those doctors that are uh, on that page actually happen to be horse owners. And so they're following one of the it asked the vet pages, the equine vet pages. And so, of course, we were getting uh, on, on all of the pages, we were getting a lot of questions about, OK, how can, can horses transmit the COVID virus, right, the yeah. coronavirus, and what are the risks and what should we do? And so it was actually nice to kind of reach out to some of those doctors and go, hey, we now invite you and grant you uh, the right to go in and respond to this question. And I think it's in everyone's interest. So there was some crossing over there. But I thought that other coronavirus group was just another example of that same, exact same thing and exact same system used or approached used. So I think, as you say, I think it could be applied in a lot of contexts. And I think people really want that, that they're seeking these, these mm -hmm. spaces where you, you, feel like, okay, this is moderated. These are people that have qualifications that, you know, at least I know that this is, these are the rules of this group. We sometimes get in these equine groups, um, uh, horse owner groups, we get people complaining that why can't other, other people also respond? They may also have, you know, they may have knowledge, they may have expertise, even though they're not veterinarians. Veterinarians don't know everything. Yeah. Why? I mean, and that's an arrogant attitude that we, we as vets often get accused, we often get accused of having, right? That we think we know everything or pretend or, you know, give the impression that we think we know everything. And so we get like uh, massage therapists, farriers, uh, whatnot, other people that also work with horses and have expertise complaining that they're not allowed to respond in the group. And the policy of the group is just, okay, the name of the group is Ask the Vet. So, got to draw the line. For good and bad, that's just, that's the premise of this group. We're not saying that people that are not veterinarians could also have useful information. Um, so, there's also, uh, so that led to another group forming, which was Ask the Agronomist or Ask the animal scientist, whatever you want to call it. So people who know about feeding, which vets don't really know much about how do you best feed your horse and what are the best supplements for this, that, and the other, la, 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 all of those things. You know, how do you manage your pasture to get the best uh, quality grass and hay and those kinds of things. So there's now a group for that, uh, probably several groups. And so, and then we, um, we, we still collaborate. So sometimes there's like, okay, somebody asked a question on our, in our group, which is like, I think it's better you go to this other group and ask because we actually don't really know much about that. And then the other way around. So, so I actually, the more I think of it, and even just this, this discussion now, Brad, I, I think that I think we'll, we'll see more of this. I think mm -hmm. people actually are craving it more or less in so many different um, contexts and in, 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 in subject areas. Yeah. Because you, you get so fed up with all of the information and, and yeah, you can, you can, you can say there's lying media out there, but certainly the media have a, a an agenda many times. Most of, most of it is just clickbait. Yeah. So something that looks outrageous, let's put it on there. We don't, we don't really care what it is. It's just going to get a lot of clicks. And so, it, it, you know, if it has uh, something with Trump, usually there's a lot of clicks. Yeah. yeah. Regardless of how irrelevant it is. <laughs> and, and also the latest study that found this or the new variant that seems ever so dangerous. And then when the... When you look at the paper that's referenced, well, that's actually not really saying anything. It's just there's another variant. We don't know how it's going to pan out yet, but yeah, potentially. But there's a lot of potential things. And so things get taken out of proportion. And and I think so So someone who's sitting there and worried about those variants, there's now uh, probably several Facebook groups in different countries. I don't know, in Germany, probably also in Germany, right? I, why wouldn't there be? Yeah. Germans are not that different from Danes. I mean... <laughs> Things are always a little smarter, but but for the most part, the Germans are okay. Um, so so if you're someone who is not, who's now worried about these variants and you want to you want somewhere to go and ask the question, you can't just go to your local doctor. That's not like you just they don't have like you can't call them and ask questions. It's right. the secretary who answers the phone, but you can go to these Facebook pages, mm -hmm. and that really helps. Yeah. So anyway, so I do think that uh, you know. That's maybe the most positive that that I've seen in this whole space because you can you can lose enthusiasm if you want to sort of look at it from a glass glass half empty uh, point of view, right? The whole communication, the whole there's too much information anyway. So so what 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 does it help to put more information out? 
which is really the skeptical sort of attitude to have, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't. I, that's not how I look at it, and I hope that's that's been made clear. Uh, I'm I'm the glass half full kind of a guy, and and I certainly think there's I think it's an obligation yeah. for us to be out there, and it shouldn't just be that person over in the communications office who's doing it for us, so we can say we we've ticked the box. They can help, and they and they may want to still put that that old fashioned press release out. That there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that has that serves a purpose. It it definitely yeah, serves but, a purpose. but it's it's a it's a supplement, right? And they can supplement these different, um, different uh, activities can supplement each other. So, so, um, so certainly it's, and I also make, try to really make that clear when I, when I discuss these things uh, internally here at the university is to, because I, the, the people that are most interested in talking with me about it are those communications offices the people working in, in in those offices and so i want to make sure that i'm not saying that we don't need them yeah of course, uh, because yeah. we really really need them but but that the approach could be could be different from what it is and they all say oh yeah they would really really welcome if the scientists would come to them with ideas for the next whatever message post news release whatever it's going to be and not the other way around right because they feel like they have to come knocking our doors and you send an email to dr so-and-so they just ignore right and they go oh COVID, it's uh you know i've been busy you know it's just all this <laughs> always that excuse they try and knock their doors and then they're like oh, i'm too busy right now i can't talk but let me come back and and so and then they feel like really uncomfortable like disturbing these busy people that apparently just don't have the time and there's only so many times you can come knock their doors or send them an email and so so yeah they would love a situ a scenario where the information would just automatically come to them instead of instead of it working the other way around yeah and that's maybe like you know maybe i was a, a little harsh as well in my earlier comments about it because I could imagine the scenario of you know someone in the comms department who signs on with the university with great ideas of like oh we could do this outreach we could do that like what about this has anyone ever thought of that and then just constantly chasing people trying to get them to 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 get interested and get on board and getting no response how yeah difficult that would be but uh, yeah. yeah, it's like you said, like if it goes the other way, if people realize that, hey, this department is here not just to produce press releases, we can maybe collaborate on something and do something. And then jumping back to the Facebook group there thing for a minute, it's all about like you're meeting people where they where they are and where they want to yep. be met. You're finding yep. the need that they need. You're not just, like we said, assuming, oh, this is the information you want, which I think is yeah. really fascinating. And I know Facebook, like one of their again for better or for worse the the ills of facebook are well known but this was a thing that they really encouraged or was trying to promote was groups right and it kind of mm-hmm. got out of control with some of the groups that were let's say not moderated not truthful yeah dealing in in inform garbage information but yeah the platform has power there in terms of yeah. bringing people together in groups so how do you best yeah. effectively do that and i think like what you're describing is a way. And then the question is, you know, how do you brand it as this is reliable versus the next group? Yeah. Cause there's going to be thousands of groups, right? Yeah. But I, I think, and, and that just gets back to how it's, how it's moderated, what the rules are in the group, mm-hmm. because everyone can cite that and go, okay, this group, this is how they run it. And then you as a potential follower can decide whether you want to follow or not. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's been how it's working. There's another thought, uh, thing I thought about just now that I wanted to maybe touch upon before we, uh, before we wrap it up. Mm-hmm. Um, so my wife, and, and so one of the reasons why I'm this much into the whole communication aspect is that I have a lovely wife whose education is in communication. And, so, and, and actually culture and communication is her is her university degree. So she's taught me most of what I can. Oh, now it becomes obvious. She's my mentor. She obvious. needs, she deserves all the credit, <laughs> right? But she's also worked at both um, when we were still in Denmark, but also here in, in publishing uh, with scientists in various uh, outlets. So we had like a newsletter here that she worked on here at the university. She also worked for a couple different equine magazines. And there's always this section of latest science, uh, the latest research, whatever, right? One thing that 
I've, I know that she's experienced is it's so hard to work with a scientist as a journalist because many of them are not comfortable with this simplifying the message uh, and maybe even leaving, leaving parts out of the story. Uh, and there's just so much pushback to that. And, and I, I think what, what we, and I do count myself in here, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I don't want to come across as, a, as the guy who thinks he's just better than anyone else in all of this. <clears throat> I think we all have a tendency of maybe being not so worried about the intended reader of whatever that is, but if one of our colleagues saw how our research is, is referenced and how we get quoted for saying things that may be at the face value in a scientific context be a little bit stretching it or just a little bit, you know, too simple, too bold or whatever it might come across as. I think a lot of us can't really uh, get out of that line of thought. Oh, what if, you know, my colleagues over at the other university that also work on this field see this and and what would they be thinking? So, so I think that also is a factor. And then certainly just that, if you're if you're if you're just too trained in in the so-called accurate uh, communication of your work, then getting anything lay oriented written is very very difficult. And so this back and forth, and certainly something that my wife has experienced a lot, and she finally ended up leaving the the newsletter because she. Uh, she felt like it was so cumbersome to just get a single piece finally approved because there's this back and forth between the the scientist and then her and back and forth before they were happy with it um, and this constant conflict from just coming from two very very different angles and in some cases just not even them really even understanding what she was trying to do and then certainly not appreciating it as being helpful um, so so she's now doing like she's she's doing a horse a dog magazine now <laughs> she's like um just to do something different but um um it's it's tough and cumbersome to work the sciences we tend to be very cumbersome people um and i i know me as well even i mean i whenever somebody sends me a draft i always have comments and i mean my my students my grad students would confirm this you know, sometimes when they send me drafts of, of papers that they're working on, so I made a bunch, I make a bunch of comments, like it's the, the paper is bleeding red, all of the comments that Martin's making. And then they address all the comments and it takes them forever. And then I, next round, I then argue against the corrections they made in response to my comments and my arguments go back to, it should be the way it was before, you know. And they're like, where, what, you know, where does he want to go? And so, so I tend to be very intense with these things. And sometimes I can, I can self-contradict just because, okay, you make all the changes. And then it actually didn't really come out the way that I was imagining it. It actually was better before. Okay, let's go back. Yeah. Um, and, and so. It's a natural a process. Journal, yeah. As a, a journalist who's trying to write, okay, there's this paper for the spring issue of fill in the blank equine magazine. Uh, about uh, you know the, just the fundamentals of deworming. <laughs> um, yeah, I think a lot of those journalists would go, "Oh, Martin Nielsen, he's he's a great, he knows a lot." Or, he, he, well, I don't know if he knows a lot. He has a lot to say, <laughs> uh, but you make sure you have enough time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 good to recognize that, and I think that this is something that I again talk with academic colleagues about too. Now being on the other side, and it's it's all yeah. it's all there. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up here, though, Martin. I'm not sure if you heard, yeah. but the little one is, he's fussing, and I think he needs some food or something, or something from me. So it's yeah, been I've a heard real... Yeah, they, they sometimes they sometimes need that, right? Yeah, there's, there's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a real Good. pleasure talking with you, and I want you to let everyone know again, like, where they can find all of this great stuff that you're doing, Twitter, YouTube. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's really very narrowly focused on parasites and horses mm -hmm. right so but if you happen to have that narrow interests that nerdy interest you know please follow me so i have my my twitter handle is at martin k nielsen and, and just make sure that you spell nielsen the danish way <laughs> uh, so the i before the e and then s-e-n 
that's where you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter I use only, uh, it's only about science. I only talk about papers that we publish or, you know, fun facts or things that we found and, and everything is, is related to to science. And I kind of, that's why I'm on Twitter. We didn't get to talk about that, but that's what Twitter is to me. There's a big science community on Twitter mm-hmm. and it's fun to be there and kind of have that exchange with other scientists. It may not be parasitologists necessarily, just people who are doing science. And, and there's, and so anyway, that's Twitter. Then I mentioned that I am the admin for the Facebook page for my department. So if you go on Facebook and search for Gluck Equine Research Center, so that's G-L-U-C-K, Gluck, uh, then you'll find us. And like I said, it's everything equine here, what we have in this department. So infectious disease, musculoskeletal disease, genetics, reproduction, and parasitology. And so um, that's a group I've been kind of administer for for quite a while. We've been able to grow the following. I mean, like I said, nothing ever really goes viral, but we went, when I kind of got involved with that group, we had 1500 followers, at least now, four or five years later, we're at 5,000. So I think that's, that's, that's pretty good. I'm, I mean, no, it could always be more. Nothing and I think there's that. plenty of room for more. I think there's many more people out there that might be interested. So that's that. So, so equine veterinary science in general. And then I have my YouTube page. So I guess I can say I'm a, I'm a YouTuber, but I really don't have very many followers is I use the page, the YouTube channel uh, to basically as a placeholder for all of the videos that I've ever made. So they're all on there. If somebody wants to share the link and embed it into a new story, that's kind of what I use it for. I really post them on, on the Facebook page where I tend to get many uh, at least a few more views mm-hmm. um, views that can be counted in the thousands and not in the tens or hundreds uh, but my 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 uh, facebook my sorry my youtube channel is just martin k nielsen equine parasitology is the name of it so that's where you'll find my silly goofy videos also all of those bad ones they're still up there so if you want to see my martin doing a really pathetic video <laughs> and it's it'll be short uh those are those are there too so um uh, yeah, so so those are my sort of platforms at the moment. Instagram uh, to be addressed, I guess. We'll uh, see. Maybe, yeah, we'll see. We'll wait. Yeah. We'll wait and see, and we'll link all all to those as well on our show notes, show page, and all that stuff. Martin, I gotta run, but I wish we could talk yeah. a little bit more. Uh, let's do it again. Sure. I mean, if you feel it's worthwhile, I'd be happy to come back. I hope you can find a few other people that are like like me, also thinking about all these things. So, you know, to maybe get their response or their input and insight into some of the things we talked about today, I, I think that would be interesting. Yeah. So, well, yeah. we got to call out there now for other scientists yeah. who want to talk about science communication. We have, we'll find the yeah. audience. Let's do it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. It's been great. All right, all right, all right. Thank you very much, Martin, for being there. Uh, It was a real pleasure to talk to you. I would love to do it again. Uh, Remember, you can follow him, Martin K. Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, on Twitter. You can look up the Gluck Equine Research. I did that right. Gluck Equine Research Center on Facebook and his YouTube channel, Martin K. Nielsen, Equine Parasitology. And you can, of course, hit us up at 2 brad for you Twitter, Instagram, 2 brad for you at gmail.com, speakpipe.com slash 2 brad for you to send us a voice message. Thank you so, so much for being here. Like I said, we will be back with more episodes more frequently now that we've got the little man sorted and, and a bit of our schedule sorted out. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Take care, everyone, and we will talk to you next time. <laughs>